If you have been with us in our study of the book of Acts, you may recall that uh, historically the context is such. Our Lord Jesus has risen from the dead after being crucified on Calvary's cross. He ascended on high before the very eyes of the disciples 40 days after the resurrection. And then He poured out His Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And the New Testament church was, was just vitalized uh, by that Holy Spirit. And the, the apostles began preaching the word. Thousands were being saved. And yet the persecution is now increasing. And we've talked in recent weeks about the way persecution seems to also be increasing in our own country. Thus, we praise God for the victory in the courts uh, in California. But we begin reading, brothers and sisters, in Acts 6. Uh, I'm going to be reading the first 15 verses. And in the broader context of our series on the entire book of Acts, this is going to kind of be a mini three-part series on Stephen. Uh, the ministry of C Stephen will take up two weeks, Lord willing. Uh, and then uh, we're going to be looking at the fact that Stephen was the first martyr in the Christian church. So there'll be kind of three weeks on, on chapters uh, 6 and 7. But we begin that little mini-series today in Acts 6, verse 1, reading through verse 15. I'll set a bit of the context in the first seven verses, and then we'll pick up our text in verse 8 of Acts chapter 6. But let us hear then the word of the Lord. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing... The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the Word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Thus far the reading of God's Word, and just again a little heads up, Lord willing, next Lord's Day we'll pick up there on Acts 7 with the first verse. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, in the Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter, our Lord Jesus tells a parable that historically has been known as the parable of the talents, translated in the NIV as the parable of the bags of gold. If you would care to turn, I'd invite you to turn there with me just for a moment. If you want to just listen, that's okay. But otherwise, turn back with me, please, to Matthew, first Gospel account, chapter 25. In the Maroon Bible, it's page 852, page 852, Matthew 25. I begin reading in verse 14 of Matthew 25. Jesus is speaking, and He says, Again, it, that is the kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, the Greek literally says five talents, 
to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And boys and girls, by the way, this is a reference to our Lord Jesus ascending into heaven, entrusting his disciples with gifts and talents, and then he's going to come back for an accounting. That's really what this is speaking about. But in verse 18, again, it says, But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And the parable goes on in similar fashion. Now, friends, I share this parable with you because of the fact that it so beautifully illustrates what happened very personally and practically with this disciple named Stephen back in the words of our scripture lesson for today. For example, if we turn back to Acts chapter 6 together, notice that in verse 1 it says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, boys and girls, young people, those were Jews who were not born in the Holy Land, they had adopted the Greek language. They had adopted Greek culture. They were called Hellenistic Jews. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, the Jews born in the Holy Land, who spoke Hebrew and or Aramaic, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, friends, needless to say, in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, care and concern, having compassion, for the widows, for the orphans, for the poor, for the needy. These were very primary themes in God's Word. And so they're bringing forward, if you will, a legitimate concern. The text picks up in verse 2. So, or therefore, the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God. The Greek literally says, the, just the words of ministry aren't in there in that, in that part of the text. It just says literally would not it would not be right for us to neglect the Word of God, okay, in order to wait on tables. Now, stay with me for a moment. Those two words, wait on, could literally be translated serve, serve tables. The Greek word is diakoneo, where we get our word deacon from. Now, it's important for us to note that the reason the apostles said it is not right for us to neglect the Word of God to wait on tables was not because they thought waiting on tables was beneath them. In fact, consider our Lord Jesus in John 13, the night he was betrayed, arrested, crucified. What did he do? He took off his outer garment, he put a towel around his waist, and he got down and he what? He washed his disciples' feet. He washed his disciples' feet. So the point wasn't that that was demeaning to them. The point was that in God's plan and purpose for his church, they had another priority. They had a higher calling for their particular role, if you will. And so they said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word, to wait on tables. And then look at verse 3. I just have to make, make sure that you understand the literalness of this. It says, brothers and sisters, and that used to drive me crazy when I would see English translations say brothers and sisters because the Greek just says Adelphoi, like Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's, it really just says Adelphoi, so probably literally it should just say brothers, but it's a generic use of the term, and so brothers and sisters is understood, okay? It's just a little thing with me. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit, boys and girls, that's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to notice prayer and the ministry, the diaconia of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. It pleased the whole group. Group And praise be to God for that, because in Psalm 133, verse 1, the psalmist says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. 
You know, I just mentioned, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I, I just mentioned before about my internocemia with all the pastors in the URC in the U.S. and Canada. And you cannot believe the divisions that are occurring in churches over this, this coronavirus thing, mass and no mass and everything else. And the, the people are turning on each other. And there's times I almost weep when I see what's going on in the broader church of Christ. Uh, because, and it's so beautiful here that this, this proposal pleased the whole group. It's a beautiful thing when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. This proposal pleased the whole group. Notice they, cho and, and they, no they chose seven men, but only two are, are expounded upon. There's only two that we know more about them than just their name. And the first one, it says, it says they chose Stephen. Uh, Greek Steve is Stephanos or Stephanos. Do you know what your name means? It means crown. It means crown. Okay, just, just for whatever that's worth. Okay, it means crown. They chose Stephanos. They chose Stephen. Notice a man full of faith. He didn't just have faith. It says he was full of faith. And what is faith? Faith, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Boys and girls, young people, faith is simply taking God at his word. That's what faith, that's faith, essentially, faith is just taking God at His word. When I was a young person in, in high school, never forget, one of our youth group made a great statement, and I always remembered it. It went like this. They said, always remember, young people, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I said that for many years. God said it, I believe it, that settles it, faith. And then I become a pastor, and one of my elders said to me, no, 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 that's not right. One of the elders said, God said it. And that settles it. <laughs> Whether or not I believe it doesn't affect the fact <laughs> that God said it, and that settles it. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's a pretty good insight, okay? But he had faith. He was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the result of that multiplying of the ministry notice, verse 7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Praise be to God. Now, as we get to the words of our text in verses 8 and following, we are going to look very carefully and prayerfully at the ministry of Stephen. That's what I'm calling my theme today, the ministry of Stephen. And we're going to look specifically at three key characteristics of the ministry of Stephen, praying that the Lord will use those characteristics to inform us and instruct us and inspire our own respective ministries before the Lord, our own respective ministries for the Lord. So the ministry of Stephen, first of all, we learn in the words of our text that the ministry of Stephen was characterized by faithful service. It was characterized by faithful service. How so? Look at verse eight with me, if you would, please. Now, Stephen, a man full of, notice again, full of God's grace and power, full of God's grace and power. Now, friends, notice how those two terms, grace and power, are in conjunction. They're very close together because they often work very closely together. What is grace? Well, again, my young friends, I learned uh, early on in my spiritual journey that grace essentially means unmerited favor. It is God giving us something that we don't deserve. That's what grace is. When I was in high school, I learned from a Christian school teacher an acrostic on grace Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And notice that as God gives us grace, we are filled with power, we are filled with dunamis, we are filled with spiritual dynamite because we can do nothing in and of ourselves. It is all gifts of God's grace. That is why, by the way, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, Paul says we have this treasure, the treasure of the gospel in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so Stephen was full of God's grace and power. And, and notice as a result, he performed great wonders and signs among the people. If you're taking notes, jot down 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, because 2 Corinthians 12.12 12 says that those are the things that mark an apostle. Interesting. Also, that word signs we met when we studied the book of John last year. It's the word samion. A sign is significant. The word samion is significant because it points to something beyond itself. It is an attestation of the truth of the gospel. It isn't a miracle for miracle's sake, if you will. But friends, think about now, skim over those verses again about this man called Stephen. He's a man who was called by God and confirmed by God's people, essentially, as we read, to wait on tables. That was his, that was his primary calling initially. He's called to wait on tables. 
But he is filled with grace. He is filled with faith. He is filled with God's spirit. He was faithful in that which God had entrusted to him to do. And as a result, God multiplied his ministry. He gave him more responsibility. And he ended up being a man who had a mighty ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit in both word and deed. In both word and deed. That's what verse 8 is talking about essentially right there in verse 8. And that begs the question. We begin with this. Have you, have I, repented of our sins and profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Have you and I personally repented? And boys and girls, I'm including you. Young people, I'm including you. Have we repented of our sins and profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Critically important point, especially when we don't know how many days God gives us on this earth to do that. In fact, if you would care to turn with me, flip over to page 995 in the Maroon Bible to the right, page 995, and turn to 2 Corinthians 5 with me. If you want to just listen, that's okay. But this is the heart of the call to repent and believe. 2 Corinthians 5, page 995. I'm picking it up in verse 20. I'm going to read through the second part of verse 6. The Apostle Paul declares, 2 Corinthians 5.20, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Steve, with all love and respect for your friends, Carrie Pettit, when she went to bed on Sunday night, never dreamed that she would not wake up on Monday morning. And her dear husband, Rob, and her daughter, Alexa, and her daughter, Jess, never thought that they wouldn't be able to see their mom on Monday during the day. But they couldn't. Her number of days was complete. And the Lord took her from them and from this life. And that could happen to any one of us. We never know. We never know. But today is the day of salvation, so praise be to God. But friends, again, I, I asked the question I started with back here concerning, concerning Stephen. What are the gifts? What are the talents? What are the abilities which God has entrusted to you or entrusted to me? What is our talent? What is our bag of gold, to use the, the language in NIV? What is our bag of gold? How many do we have? And were Christ to return in the clouds of glory today to judge the living and the dead, and we gave an account, would he say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been, you have been faithful to a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Or will he say, as that parable goes on to say, cast this wicked servant out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, you see. Think about that. We could use Stephen as a as a spiritual standard, if you will, by which we can evaluate our own spiritual, spiritual faithfulness in that regard. Because as, as the book of Acts, the sixth chapter, tells us in no uncertain terms, the ministry of Stephen was characterized by faithful service. It was characterized by faithful service. Well, friends, let's go back to our text in, uh, in Acts chapter 6 together, where we find, secondly, that the ministry of Stephen caused him to be forcefully seized. It forced him to be forcefully seized. How so? Let's pick it up in verse 8 of Acts 6. We'll go into verse 9. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. Now, friends, I have a footnote in my study Bible which says, the synagogue of the freedmen were persons who had been freed from slavery. They came from different Hellenistic areas. And then those areas are mentioned. If you'll follow along, I'll read you some of the footnotes in my study Bible about them. They were Jews from Cyrene. Cyrene is the chief, uh, was the chief city in Libya of North Africa. Uh, some of them were from... Um, Alexandria. Alexandria was the capital of Egypt, second only to Rome in the empire. Uh, had a population, by the way, of about 100,000. Alexandria was a great uh, education center uh, in the ancient Near East. They were from Cyrene. Uh, they were from Alexandria. They were from Cilicia, a Roman province in the southeast corner of Asia Minor. Uh, where Paul of Tarsus was from, that's in that area. It's in the, if you can picture the Mediterranean Sea, it's in the uh, northeast corner of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. 
and some of them were from Asia. And uh, Asia is a Roman province in the western part of Asia Minor, which is today in western Turkey. So that's where the synagogue of the freedmen come, who were arguing, and they were, began to argue with Stephen. Think about this. One commentator I read, friends, said this, the most fruitful lives invite the most criticism. The, mo the most fruitful lives invite the most criticism. One commentator said that. But he also said that maybe because these were freedmen recently set free from slavery, they were especially passionate in defending their Jewish faith. And we're going to really stand against anybody who seemed to be contradicting what they had been taught concerning the law of Moses and the ceremonies and sacrifices of the law and so on. But whatever the case, they began to argue with Stephen. Notice verse 10. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. My young friends, remember this. Always remember this. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we fear God, we need not fear any man and that fear of the Lord begins a wisdom which, with which God fills us to overflowing so we can stand against all opposition to the faith. That's what happened here with Stephen. In fact, not only so, if you would care to turn with me, let's go back to the, uh, the Gospel of Luke just for a moment. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke chapter 21. In the uh, Maroon Bible, it's page 904. Luke chapter 21, page 904. And uh, Jesus is speaking in Luke 21, verses 5 and following, about the destruction of the temple. He prophesied that. It occurred historically in 70 A.D. when the Roman general Titus laid siege to Jerusalem and burned the temple to the ground. And he's talking about signs of the end times. Friends, drop down with me, please, to Luke 21, verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Notice, but before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues, what just happened to Stephen, and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, notice, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And that's precisely what happened with Stephen. They began to argue with him. Let's go back to our text in Acts chapter 6. They began to argue with him, but, but God had given him all this wisdom. And so verse 10 says they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. But they weren't going to give up so easily. They were not going to simply be quiet and walk away. Look at verse 11. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, if you will. They produced false witnesses. They produced soides martyres. The, the Greek says, so, that's where we get our word soito from, like, like quasi. But basically, boys and girls, they brought forth people who would lie. They brought forth witnesses who would lie against Stephen and about Stephen. By the way, just as the religious leaders did against our Lord Jesus when he was betrayed and, and arrested and crucified, they produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. They were lying. They were lying. And boys and girls, young people, ask yourself this question. If we lie to our parents, to our brothers and sisters, to our teachers, to our friends, to whoever, when we lie, and it goes for all of us as adults too, when we lie, whose hand are we playing into? Yes, thank you. Satan's hand. Jesus said in John 8, verse 44, Satan is the father of lies. And when we lie, we're playing into Satan's hands. Do you remember a year ago we were studying John 8, 44, uh, and, I, and I called my sermon, Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> Who's Your Daddy? Well, when we're lying, it's like Satan's our daddy. It's like he's our father. We're, we're playing into his hands. And that's what they accused Stephen of. They said, we've heard him say, look at verse 14, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Well, Stephen may have been preaching that because Jesus did. Remember in John 2, 19, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. 
But as verse 21 of John 2 goes on to tell us, the Jews didn't understand that the temple he had spoken of was his body. And so he may very well have been speaking about, about uh, I'll destroy this place. And think about it. The temple was the center of worship for the Jews. So to attack the temple was like atta- attacking God himself in the Jews' mind. And why did they say also that he was preaching against changing the, or preaching change the customs of Moses that Moses handed down to us? Well, the reason he was was because Jesus fulfilled all the sacrifices and ceremonies of the law. And when they were, heard that, that there was a once and for all sacrifice for sins on Calvary's cross, you didn't need to sacrifice Jesus over and over again every day, by the way, as the priests do in the Roman Catholic Mass, but that's a message for another time. They, they thought he was blaspheming. And so they rose up against him. They, he, they, they said he's changing the customs of Moses handed down to us. Now, friends, that begs this question. Stephen's testimony, in word and in deed, caused that opposition to arise. As we will see, his life literally was in danger. But it begs the question, does your or my testimony of faith in word and in deed create any opposition? Does it, does it upset anybody? Does it disturb anyone? Have we ever upset or offended someone, spiritually speaking, while we were speaking or living the truth anywhere, any place, at any time? You know, I wasn't going to share this either, but it just occurred to me again that many years ago, John Wesley went through a long period of time where he was experiencing no persecution for the faith and for his preaching. And he began to think that the Spirit of God left him. And from what I read anyway, he got off his horse, he knelt down, he was next to this big hedge, and he just started praying and pleading with God to show him that his spirit was still in him. He was still being used mightily of God. He was still preaching the truth of God's word. And all of a sudden, there were some guys on the other side of the hedge hearing him pray, took great offense, and they started throwing bricks through the hedge, and and they hit John Wesley. And he said, praise be to God, he's still with me. He's, he's, He's still with me. But I've been thinking about this. When was the last time... I offended, upset, confronted, convicted anybody by my own testimony of the gospel in word or in deed. And how long has that been? Many years ago, I've read this, when the knights of King Arthur's court would return from the battlefield, If they were not bearing some kind of wound or mark from the battle, King Arthur would throw them back out there to the conflict and say, go get your scar. Go get your scar. And I was wondering, when you consider the uncompromised commitment and sacrifice of our brothers and sisters in the New Testament church, when we consider what's going on in Belarus or in Indonesia or many Muslim countries, the per- China, the perse- North Korea, the persecution that our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ are facing all over the world for what we profess to believe. And you think of how comfortable we have it as Christians. And I'm including myself first in this and how we so frequently keep our head down and our mouth shut when we have opportunity for witness. Would, would our King, Jesus, return to us today and say to you or to me, get back out there and go get your scar. And go get your scar. The ministry of Stephen, characterized by faithful service, caused him to be forcefully seized, and then finally, and all too briefly, he carried on with his face shining. He carried on with his face shining. Look at verse 15 of Acts 6 with me, if you would. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. The Greek says they fixed their gaze on him. Why? They probably wanted to see if they had frightened the daylights out of him and were wondering what he was going to say. Well, in chapter 7, we'll learn what he said. (laughs) But they fixed their gaze at him. And notice, though, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It was radiant. Boys and girls, probably similar to the face of Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the law. Probably similar to the face of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was up there with Peter, James, and John. But I've been contemplating and and kind of pondering this, 
this idea of his face being radiant like the face of an angel and a few texts came to my mind. Psalm 34, verse 5, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Psalm 34, 5, Proverbs 15, 13, a happy heart makes the face cheerful. A happy heart makes the face cheerful. Daniel 12, verse 3, the prophet Daniel declares, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And then finally, one commentator put it this way, and I quote, the light on Stephen's face was the smile that recognized the best of friends who was graciously fulfilling his promise and being with his suffering, with his suffering people always, end of quote. The ministry of Stephen carried on with his face shining. Well, friends, as we close, if you want to just listen, that's okay, but I'd like you to turn with me just momentarily to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24. Second, after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, it's page 999 in our Maroon Bible, page 999, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, and I'm going to read through verse 29. Probably no one ever suffered for the cause of Christ more than did the Apostle Paul, certainly in New Testament times. And in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 24, notice what Paul suffered for the faith. He said, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Remember that from a week or so ago? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I had been constantly on the move. I had been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I daily face the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. Think about that. Think of the suffering of Paul for Christ. And yet, friends, turn back a page or two to the left with me, if you would please, to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. A few pages to the left, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. And still in all, Paul says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. Verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer together. Our mighty God and ever faithful Heavenly Father, nearly 2,000 years ago, the sorely suffering Apostle Paul also penned the words, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. O oh Lord our God, may we here at the Pocono Reformed Bible Church increasingly be numbered among your strong, weak people. <laughs> Admittedly very weak in and of our, ourselves, but confessing as well that we are incredibly strong in you. For as the Apostle Paul elsewhere declares, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And so, Father, as individual Christians, and as a fledgling flock of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Pocono Mountains of PA, like Stephen, may we be filled with faith and grace 
and power. And may we increasingly be found as bold and effective witnesses for the cause of Christ in word and in deed, no matter what the cost. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we might be able to carry on, as it were, like Stephen, with our our faces shining, no matter how intense the pressure or pain or persecution may be. Helping us, Father, in the words of the Apostle Paul, always to remember that if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Hear us, Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.